everybody. How are you? It's Tim again from C8 Wines. And today we're going to try and take on the monumental task of doing a very quick and short run through one of the largest wine growing regions of the world. We're headed to France. So France is one of the top four largest wine producing regions in the world. Those being um, Italy, Spain, the U.S. and France. France being number one currently, uh, making seven, between seven and eight billion, with a B, bottles of wine every single year. And these are crazy numbers. I mean, absolutely massive amounts. Um, of those eight billion bottles, we have 56 different grape varieties that are currently allowed to be produced in France under a designated origin label. And the amount of property under vine currently sits at 861,075 hectares. That is that's larger than some small countries. So really, really impressive production of wine going on in France. So a little bit of a brief history. Um, there are traces of the wine um, production happening in France more than 600 years before Christ. Okay, so uh, sixth century BC was, was when we started to see vine growing happening in France with the colonization of the Southern Gaul, which is the Southern part near the Mediterranean. Um, and this was done by a lot of Greek settlers back in the day. So they brought their own vines, their own um, winemaking traditions from Greece, and they founded the city of Marseille, which is right on the right on the Mediterranean coast in Provence. Those of you who have been there before will know. Um, for from that is how it's expanded into France. Um, so wine has been around for thousands of years in the countries on the Mediterranean, but France made it part of their civilization and has considered winemaking as an art for over 2,000 years. So it's a huge part of who they are and what they do on a daily, daily basis. It's part of everyday life for every single person who lives in France. Um, the Gauls, when they came, they knew how to cultivate vines and they knew how to prune them. Um, and the pruning was important distinction in the difference between cultivated vines and wine, uh, wine, wild wine vines um, for producing grapes. So after that, those wines that were started, you know, they started to be known around the civilized world at that time uh, because they were being taken by, you know, with armies uh, as sustenance through conquests around the world and they became known everywhere. Um, the Roman Empire actually licensed a lot of those regions throughout the south part of France um, to produce wine for their armies. Um, from that point, during the Middle Ages, uh, you would see the monks um, and monasteries took over the management of most of the vineyards of France. Um, and most importantly, they were the ones who created the current books, basically, of wine making knowledge and skill um, through obviously what was a very turbulent period of history. Um, so, you know, the 10th and 11th centuries, the, the monks wrote down everything that they were doing on a daily basis, how, how to prune the vines, how, what time to pick them, um, you know, when they were at their best for ripeness, how to store them, how to even put them in a bottle. Um, you know, they were the first ones to bottle wine. Um, a monk, Dom Perignon, very famous, was the first person to trap bubbles in a bottle of wine and make champagne as we know it. Um, so the monks in the monasteries were huge in the development of the wine industry throughout, not just France, but throughout most of the, the old world. Um, the, the monasteries were super important, mostly because they had the money, they had resources, they had security, and they had the inventiveness to be able to produce a constant supply of, of wine for both for mass, for the church, um, and for profit for them to continue making more wine. 
Um, the best vineyards in France were all owned by monasteries and their wine was considered to all be, always be superior until the, the time around the French Revolution when nobility started to develop, develop extensive vineyards um, around their properties, but still would normally be looked after and tended to by whatever church was on their land. Um, until the French Revolution uh, came along and then, and then everybody, you know, all of the nobility um, had all of their land confiscated and then redistributed. Now, all of that was all well and good up until 1855. And then in 1855, all of the wine vines of Europe were completely destroyed by a little bug. It's a louse that uh, basically would eat all of the rootstock um, up into the vine itself called phylloxera. And phylloxera decimated the wine industry all over Europe. Um, and so having to restart all of the vines that are currently in France are all American vines. So prior to phylloxera, um, people in, in the West coast of, uh, of the United States, obviously California, uh, California, very booming wine industry in the early and mid 1800s. Um, they, took these, these cuttings and clippings from uh, French vines, they took them to California. And then in California, they replanted them there and they grew and they had all these amazing French wine vines growing in California. Phylloxera comes along. All of the vines of France are destroyed. So the French ask in return to have the vines back. So they took the same clippings from their original French vines and took them back to France and replanted them. So all of, all of the vines in France in modern times are all of American descent. It's a really interesting fact. So let's look at the, at the, the divisions of, of the controlling ways of, of labeling these things. Um, so we talk all the time in these videos about DOs, the uh, designation of origin or denomination of origin, depending on where you're from. Um, in France, they basically were the first to create this system, um, and their system is called the AOC system, the Appellation d'Origin Contrôlé system. Um, now, the AOC system in 2012 was completely changed and now it's an a now it's called the AOP system so Appellation d'Origine Protégé okay so just everyone will talk about AOC because it was like that for almost a hundred years but it is now called the AOP system okay um, so the original version of this of all of the wine that's being produced in France 11.7 percent of that wine is vin, vin de table or just table wine Table wine is the simple, you know, from casks that they would be pouring in bistros, um, marketplaces, you know, typical small market kind of mom and pop places where they have their own wines that they have in cask and then it's just open the cask up into a jug and then they pour the jugs at the table, okay? It's super, super inexpensive. You're talking about pennies, pennies a liter, okay? Very, very, very cheap. And then the next level up would be the Vin de Pays, which is 33.9% of total production. Um, so this usually on a label will carry a specific region within France. So uh, for example, Vin de Pays d'Oc, uh, D apostrophe O-C, comes from the Languedoc, okay? Vin de Pays Côte de Gascogne is from Gascony. So it would have a tag along, but it is just Vin de Pays plus wherever it's from, okay? easy to understand. Um, so that allows the producers to distinguish their wines that are made using grape varieties or procedures other than those required by the AOC rules. So if you have, if you have a wine and you wanna try and do something cool and funky, modern, and try a new technique that no one's done before, you can't be rated under the AOC. They, they, they don't allow it. The rules are there for a reason, they're super strict. Um, and it's kind of to give you a consistency in your product, okay? So then we get up into the quality stuff, um, and there was two, used to be two different variations. 
So 0.09% would be VDQS, okay? Vin délimité de qualité supérieure. So this is a superior quality wine from the Vin de Pay. All right? It's less strict than AOC rules. Um, and it's usually used for smaller areas uh, or as the waiting room kind of a vibe for up and coming areas that don't yet have AOC de designation, but are, are on their way to getting an AOC designation. Um, but this, this uh, category was, it was uh, abolished in 2011 when they brought in the new system in 2012. And then the Appellation de Rogen de Controle is 53.4% of total wine being produced in all of France. 34.3% of that is white and the rest being red, basically. Okay. Um, so as we uh, talk about the, the, the changes that were made to this system. So in 2012, um, the system became three instead of four. Um, so the VDQS basically was eliminated. And now you have uh, Vin de France, which is basically just simple table wine, uh, but it also allows you now to put the grape variety and a vintage year on a label. Whereas table wine in France before that didn't, didn't do that. Um, the Indication Geographic Protégé. Now this is kind of a takeoff on what the Italians have been doing for many years, uh, where they have what's called Indication Geographica Typica, IGT. Um, and they created that system a long time ago because of the quality of the wines that were coming out of Tuscany that did not fall underneath, under the designations of their DOC or DOCG wines. Um, so they gave them a new category that helped people understand that these were high quality wines and they were justified in the prices that they were charging for them. Um, now, IGP wines in, in France are not going to command the same amount of um, price that an, uh, an AOP wine is going to command. So the IGP wines in France will be that middle level and obviously much less expensive. Um, the AOP, which is now Appellation d'Origine Protégé instead of Controle, um, it is the highest category basically replacing what the original AOC wine category was. Um, so the largest changes that happened in this was, uh, was in the Vin de France category and then the, the elimination of the VDQS wines completely. Um, so they either had to be requalified and had to be turned into an AOP wine if it was good enough, if it was able to make the jump, or it was downgraded into an IGP category. Um, because it was less than 1% of the total wine, it, it just made sense to do it that way. Um, so for a former AOC wine, if you were already an AOC wine to move to an AOP wine, it really didn't mean anything except for changing terminology on your labels. You had to change the way that your labels were done. Um, and the actual names of the appellations themselves completely remained unchanged. Nothing actually changed. Uh, no new wines have been marketed under old designations from 2012. Bottles already in distribution didn't have to be relabeled, thankfully, because it would have saved a ton of money. Okay, so let's talk about what comes out of France. So uh, France basically covers every gamut, okay? White wine, red wine, rosé, dry wines, sweet wines, semi-sweet wines, sparkling wines, fortified wines. They, they cover the whole gamut and they comes from all different regions of the, of the uh, country. You have 56 different um, varieties of grapes that are allowed to be in these wines. So huge amounts of variety, enormous combinations of whatever you want to do, and they can come from anywhere, okay? Um, here's a little bit of, a, of an interesting tidbit for you. Um, I'm just looking at the top, let's look at the top 15 grape varieties based on the amount of grape vines that are currently planted. And I'm looking at them and I, and, I, and I think to myself, I would never in a million years have put them in this order. So number one, and I would have suggested this would have been number one or number two, um, is Merlot, okay? Merlot accounts for 13.6% of the total grape, grape growing 
in all of France. So that's 116,715 hectares of land. That is an enormous amount of Merlot, okay? Next would be Grenache. Grenache being number two, I think that I thought this is a little bit interesting for me, but um, I, can, I can see it being as Grenache is huge in the Languedoc, in the southern parts of, of France, in the Rhone Valley specifically. Um, everybody knows, uh, you know, that the Rhone is known for the, the GSM wines, Grenache, uh, Syrah, and Muverda, all of those come from the Rhone Valley. But I did not think that it would be number two but it, it's uh, it's accounting for 11.3% of the total wine growth um, of France, which is really interesting. Now, this is the one that I find the most interesting. Number three on this list is a, is a, is a grape that I've never had before, um, and I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but it's called Ugni Blanc, okay? U-G-N-I, Ugni Blanc. And it, is, it accounts for 9.7% of the total area of grapes grown in all of France, 83,000 hectares. And I've never even heard of it. I think that is absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And then let's we go through the, the rest of the top 15. So Syrah at number four, Carignan, which I love and many people already know. If you're here in the Bahamas and you, you've come and, and had wine with us, you, you probably have had um, one of our wines that has a lot of Carignan in it. Uh, called Cotamato. It sold out very, very quickly in its first run here. Um, next, number six would be Cabernet Sauvignon, which I would have thought would have been a lot higher up this list. Uh, the, the, the next highest uh, white wine at number seven is Chardonnay, and that's very, makes a lot of sense. It's really the primary grape of Burgundy, of Champagne, um, and a lot, of, a lot of other regions as well, specifically in the Languedoc, a lot of it is grown over 43,000, was 44,000 hectares of Chardonnay grown in France. Number eight is Cabernet Franc, which is one of the blending grapes of Bordeaux and one of my favorites. Uh, number nine, Gamay Noir. Now Gamay Noir, uh, having grown up in, in Canada, in the near the Niagara wine region of Canada, I totally understand Gamay Noir because we grew a lot of it there. Um, it's kind of an introductory wine into the red grapes for, for people who are learning a little bit about wine. It's very light, it's very fruity, but it's the wine specifically of Beaujolais. Um, so you will recognize it as that. Most people just call it Beaujolais, but the grape variety is actually Gamay Noir. Uh, number 10 is Pinot Noir, and I find it really interesting that Pinot Noir is behind both Gamay and Cab Franc, being as it's the primary grape of Burgundy and the primary grape of Champagne. A lot of the white, well, a lot of the white champagnes that you drink are actually made mostly from Pinot Noir. Really interesting stuff. And then from there, the, the sort of filling out the top 15, Sauvignon Blanc, Cinso, Melin de Bourgogne, which uh, that's a really funky grape. We'll try and get into some of that sometime. Um, Semillon, which is the white grape of Bordeaux. Uh, and Pinot Meunier, which is a blending grape in the Champagne region. And then there's all kinds of other ones down there, you know, obviously Grenache Blanc, Viognier, Colombard, Muscat Blanc, Malbec, Alicante, Chenin Blanc, uh, Riesling, Vermentino, Gewürztraminer, Tanat. I mean, there's so many and you know most of them, you've heard most of them, but it's crazy just how much wine is being produced in France. All right, let's talk about, um, let's talk about terroir for a second, okay? So the concept of terroir, which obviously is a French word, um, it is super important to the French. Um, and I find that when you're drinking a new world wine next to an old world wine, it's very easy to pick which one is which because of the concept of terroir, which is so important to the winemakers of Europe, okay? Um, it, what it does is it refers to the unique combination of the natural factors associated with any particular vineyard, all right? It's important to all winemakers. Um, but these factors are gonna include things like soil, uh, the underlying rock, um, you know, things like limestone and clay, um, altitude, uh, the slope or the hill uh, of the hill or its terrain, what its drainage is like, um, the orientation of the hill towards the sun, 
Um, and then the microclimates that are in that same area um, to like, what is its typical rain, the wind, humidity, temperature variations, etc. cetera. Um, even in the same area, no two vineyards have exactly the same terroir and thus is the basis of the Appellation d'Origion Couture. That's what made it happen in the first place and why it has become the model for the Appellation and wine laws in every region of the globe, all right? In other words, when the same grape variety is planted in different regions, it can produce wines that are significantly different from each other. Um, in France, the concept of terroir, it manifests itself mostly, like the most extremely, in the Burgundy region. So Burgundy has over 100 classified AOCs, just in Burgundy alone, right? It's incredible, it's absolutely insane. So let's talk about the regions of France, all right? There are 17 primary wine areas. They're not all wine regions, but they are all wine areas. Um, and I'll just quickly run through them in alphabetical order, starting with Alsace, Beaujolais, Bordeaux, Brittany, Burgundy, Champagne, Corsica, Ile-de-France, Jura, Languedoc-Roussillon, Loire, Normandy, Picardy, Provence, Rhone, Savoy, and the southwest of France. And those are the 17 main areas. Uh, there are several smaller production areas situated outside of these major areas. Uh, most of those were, uh, were in the VDQS system. Um, and some of the more northern locations are just remnants of production areas that used to be there but are no longer there. Um, let's just for a second concentrate on a couple of these for you. Um, so starting with Burgundy, like I said, Burgundy has a hundred different AOCs, all right? Um, and they're all broken down from the Grand Cru level um, all the way down to more non-specific regional uh, appellations. Most of them are like the name of a little town, okay? Um, so when you're driving through the Côte de Bonne, for example, Côte de Bonne is a large area specifically good for uh, for white wines, for Chardonnay. But when you're driving through it, every little tiny town you hit um, is its own AOC designation. And inside of that AOC designa designation, there are little um, changes based on whether it's a Grand Cru or Premier Cru or uh, Vin de Pays. Again, it's, a, it's a broken down based on its designates. So, that happens in every single region in France, not to the same extreme as, as Burgundy, but it does happen. Now, a cool, interesting fact a lot of people don't really, don't always know, is that Beaujolais is actually inside of Burgundy. It is part of the Bur Burgundy um, designation. And so is Chablis. So a lot of people think that Chablis is just its own place. Well, it is its, it is its own place, but it does fall under Burgundy's AOCs, okay? Next up would be Bordeaux, and to me, Bordeaux is the king of all wine. Um, once you have great Bordeaux, it's kind of hard to ever go back to anything different. Um, they're just, they're so um, expressive and intense and rich and full of, of complexity. And they're just, it's incredible, the experience of drinking top level Bordeaux. Um, so let's just sort of give you a little peek at some of these. So in my, behind me, I've got a, a little selection of different wines from around the regions. So starting in Bordeaux, here is, um, for example, this is a Grand Cru class, Chateau Papremont, very, very popular, very famous, um, and very expensive. Um, amazing stuff. The winemaker, Bernard Magrath, is a legend. He, um, he basically gets farmed out to, to make wine for you know, 50 or 60 different wineries. Belfont Belsier, we um, unfortunately missed out last year. We were supposed to, to, to stay with the owner of this winery. This is a Grand Cru in St. Emilion. Um, we were supposed to stay with him in September of last year um, for the harvest and pick grapes with the family. Um, unfortunately, then uh, Hurricane Dorian decided other, other ideas for us. Uh, moving along, Pouillac, and this is one of the great wines of, of the world, uh, Chateau Ponte Canet. 
Um, fantastic wine uh, from the Poyac region of Bordeaux. And then we skip to, let's slip, skip to Burgundy. And you can see right away the bottle shape changes. So Burgundian bottles are a different shape than the Burgundy bottles. Um, and this is uh, basically we talk about, it's just as we did in our reading, our label reading uh, video earlier, that's the, the designate, this one is Montelli. Montelli is a small little village. Um, and then it has the different uh, designates as, as it would have to be from your DOC or your AOP wines. So this is an actual AOP Montelli. Villevigne. Okay, and then we go from, there's another one. This is, this is a Chablis, um, again in Burgundian bottle because it is technically a Burgundy, uh, but it is from the Chablis region. Um, champagne, obviously. You can tell um, because of the foil and, and uh, amazing, amazing stuff. If you've never had Lallier Champagne, um, they're one of the few houses that do a vintage year every year, which I, I think is really cool. Um, so a couple of the Laliers, and then into the Languedoc Roussillon area, and Languedoc again, like Burgundy, has an enormous amount of smaller AOC or AOP. Sorry, I keep keep saying AOC because you know that's what we learned. Um, now they are AOP wines, and this is from AOP Saint Shinian. This is the wine I was talking about earlier when I was uh, mentioning how I loved Carignan. So this wine is a 50% Carignan uh, with some Grenache and some Syrah in it as well. And very, very popular here in the Bahamas. So a little run through, quick little glance at some of the different regions, some of the different wine styles. Um, it's really important kind of for us to, to uh, remember that you know, over the last, you know, many hundred years, the primary consumer of French wine has always been French people. And now over the last 40 years, the amount of wine being sold in relativity to the population base in France has dropped more than 25%. So the French are no longer drinking their own wine. Um, and I'm not sure if that's um, because they're, they're just not drinking um, or if it's because of, you know, the amount of competition from new world, um, a lot of inexpensive wines, a lot of, you know, good quality inexpensive wines being produced around the world, Chile, Argentina, uh, South Africa, you know, some parts of the U S uh, are doing good inexpensive wines. You've got Australia and New Zealand, and there's just so much competition for your wine dollar that I think you're starting to see some of that diversification really affecting the amount of wine that's being produced in France. And one of the things that I find most interesting is they have a term for all the extra wine that is produced in France, and it's called uh, the wine lake, okay? And a lot of this wine is then being turned into distillates. So you've heard of Ciroc or Grey Goose vodkas. Most of that distillate product of that is wine they couldn't sell. So they, they're distilling grapes instead of grain in order to make um, a, a distillate based alcohol um, out of the original grapes that they couldn't sell. So they are changing, they are changing um, the way they use their current grapes. And the government of France actually has actually started um, paying wine, winery vineyard owners to just pull their vines up and get rid of them and plant something different. So the government will subsidize you to give up planting grapes. It's fascinating. Um, so a large, uh, you know, in, in a large part of that is, is the emergence of just how much wine the Languedoc region is producing. Um, there's there's a lot of information out there. You can go on, on um, I think it's either Netflix or Amazon Prime, and you can. There's a documentary about um, terrorist groups that are being formed in order to try and destroy a lot of this glut of Languedoc wine from entering the French market. It's really fascinating, fascinating stuff. 
Anyway, so this has been a very quick, as quick as I possibly could, not probably as quick as I should be, but as quick as I possibly could run through all of the areas of France and just a little bit of background knowledge about French wine and French winemaking, French grapes and such. Um, all of the popular grape varieties that you have ever heard of are all basically French grapes. So that's a little bit of background on that. Um, as we go through the series, we're going to try and break down some of these regions in much more detail and give you a little bit more knowledge about specifics, you know, things like in Burgundy and Bordeaux and, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get into the Rhone Valley down, down the way and Provence, uh, the Languedoc. We'll break some of these areas down for you so that you get a better understanding of each one of them in particular. But for today, I'm going to leave it at that. And I hope you guys learned something today and, uh, and I didn't bore you to tears. So we'll see you again next time. And uh, grab yourself a glass of French wine and enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.